Good evening everyone and welcome to tonight's New Israel Fund Australia event, Our History, Our Future. We'll be joined by two esteemed figures, Sir Simon Sharma and Professor Deborah Lipstadt, as well as Professor David Myers, a renowned historian in his own right, for a discussion about challenges to democracy, the rise of anti-Semitism, racism and violence, and how we move forward towards a better future. My name's Liam Gatroy, I'm the Executive Director of NIF in Australia, and it's my privilege tonight to introduce to you our three guests. There's more than a thousand people joining us tonight. It's really great to see our community out in such big numbers. Uh, but it's important to realize that even though we're in our own corners of the country, on our own iPads, we all live on what always has been and always will be Aboriginal land. Here in Sydney, where I am, I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I want to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Before we get underway tonight, I just want to share a word with you about the New Israel Fund. We are a partnership of Israelis and Diaspora Jews dedicated to upholding the values of Israel's Declaration of Independence, values that promote a more inclusive, just and equitable Israel for everyone who lives there. Since it was created more than 40 years ago, NIF has invested more than half a billion dollars in hundreds of projects and organizations right across the country. Our core work is creating real impact through grassroots organizations on the ground. We reduce social and economic gaps, including by targeting the needs of those most affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, like refugees and asylum seekers. Today, 30,000 of them regularly go without food, having lost their jobs more than a year ago because of the pandemic. We combat racism and, and discrimination, including that felt by the LGBT community, Arab citizens of Israel, and Jewish immigrants from Ethiopia and the former Soviet Union. And of course, we also work with millions of Palestinians living in the West Bank and Gaza, who suffer daily under Israeli occupation. Now, we wanted to host tonight's event because it's one of the reasons that we invest in these projects, which create a shared and open Israeli society, which is free of racism and discrimination. And that's because of our own history as Jews. We know what it's like to face hatred. We know what it's like to be marginalized and to watch as the structures that are supposed to protect us instead fall around us. And so by showcasing these three wonderful historians, all with deep relationships and histories with the New Israel Fund, we can bring bridge these two worlds between the way that we understand our reality of Jews in the diaspora, in diaspora democracies, as minorities fighting for equality and the protection from discrimination, and the reality of the Jewish state, where Jews are the majority and have the power to shape its own democratic institutions and to ensure equality for all. So now, let me introduce to you tonight's special guests. So Simon Sharma, the first, is one of the world's most popular and prolific historians. He's a professor of art history history and history at Columbia University and a contributing editor of the Financial Times. He's an award-winning author and writer-presenter of more than 50 documentaries, including The Story of the Jews. Professor Deborah Lipstadt is a professor of modern Jewish history and Holocaust studies at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. In addition to her many books and writings on anti-Semitism and the Shoah, she is also known for her libel trial against Holocaust denier David Irving, which was depicted in the 2016 film Denial. And our conversation tonight will be facilitated by NIF's global president, David Myers, a professor of Jewish history at UCLA and director of the UCLA Luskin Center for History and Policy. And he's written also very widely in the fields of Jewish intellectual and cultural history. And with that, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. I want to pass it on to welcome properly us to the event, David Myers. Thank you, Liam, and welcome to our audience in Australia. I remember my time in 2015 in Melbourne as the guest of Monash University and our exceptional host, Mark Baker, with the greatest of fondness. And we in the wider NIF orbit look on with great admiration at NIF Australia, which is so ably led by Liam and Ilana Snyder. One of the defining features of NIF Australia and Australian Jewry in general is the deep historical connection to the two anchoring events of 20th century Jewish history the Holocaust, and the founding of the State of Israel. And given that rootedness, rootedness in history, it's fitting, I think, to be in conversation with two of the most renowned historians in the world today, Sir Sh Simon Shama and Professor Deborah Lipstadt. So let's jump right in by situating ourselves in time. One of the most often invoked literary references uh, is to Dickens' Tale of Two Cities, the best of times, the worst of times. It, is, it so often seems as if both are always true. So let's think of today uh, set against that literary reference. How would you situate the world today 
Um, is the world as you see it in precipitous free fall or um, in fact on the path of steady, if not irreversible progress? And, and where are the Jews in that picture? So a big question, a macro question about how we situate ourselves in the world today. Um, Sir Simon Shama, would you like to start us off? <laughs> we'll trust you, David, to come up with a kind of universal <laughs> question, but it is it is the big one. And of course, actually, you must you <coughs> you must expect historians, of course, to say neither one nor the other, really, no, best or worst. Um, I mean, obviously, there are uh, you know profound structural um, challenges is the polite political term for this. Um, so, but you know, uh, the, the unsustainability of our present course of environmental degradation being one. I, I, I often think that every kind of historical subject, including Jewish history, um, that we tackle is sort of circumscribed by the basic datum um, of the slow death of the sustainable planet, really. Um, and uh, so this is this is very bad news. The pandemic, in fact, because of the recent history of most infectious diseases that are alarming occurring zoonotically, that's to say a spillover jump from the animal population to the human population, that's almost, I think it's risky to say this, a scientific consensus, means that those two things are linked. And if we say to ourselves, and I'm still on the kind of worst of times to inside, um, if we say to ourselves, well, surely these huge ecumenical universal questions on which the future of humanity necessarily depends would pull us all together towards a more global view and be less dug in in our tribal foxholes. Of course, the, the dreaded specter of so-called vaccine nationalism has offered some very sobering evidence to the opposite. Against that, however, and if our friend Stephen Pinker were here, he would have started with this, is the absolute miracle of, um, of, of um, scientific progress, which has produced, as Donald Trump was never tired of saying, crediting himself with the advance, uh, a real miracle of speed with not just the production and delivery of vaccine, albeit unevenly, but also the kind of understanding of the of the dynamics of the pandemic and of the virology and epidemiology behind it. So you know we're in we're in a, a tug of war. And if if um, as you absolutely want to say in an NIF context, really, you know where do the Jews stand all this? We are obviously at one and the same time a tribal people and a profoundly anti-tribal people. Um, mm -hmm. Science is cosmopolitan. Israel has had a spectacular success through its scientists, really, and through the way it's dealt with the pandemic. So on the one hand, the sort of Jewish tradition of the exchange of knowledge, of knowledge crossing frontiers, um, you know, puts us on, on the side of uh, a global approach, a multilateral approach to what can be done. On the other hand, of course, Israel and Jewish history, and I gather we're going to be talking about this in more detail a bit later, David, um, Israel is not exempt from the rage of national tribal feeling. Great. This is an excellent um, uh, opportunity now to pass on to Deborah to pick up. Uh, well, uh, not surprisingly, especially when you're sharing a screen with Sir Simon Shama, uh, I'm going to agree with virtually everything he said. Uh, I was going to start, <laughs> in fact, as he reached the end, with the miracle of the vaccines. Uh, little did I dream even a year ago, maybe a year ago, that I would be praising something that's a result of big pharma, as we call it in this country, and I think in other countries, which has given us so many things, including the opioid epidemic uh, and what they're doing. And little did I think I would have anything good to say about the Trump uh, regime, as I like to call it, um, but the way they expedite, they didn't do the scientific research once it was done, but they expedited it. Um, of course, as uh, Sir Simon said, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it comes with uneven distribution, et cetera. But I'm reminded of the fact that, I don't know, was it a year ago, maybe a little more than that, maybe a little less, maybe I think even less, that Dr. Anthony Fauci, who is a rock star amongst many of us here in the United States, 
sitting in the Oval Office said, well, vaccines usually take three to four years to produce, and now we mm -hmm. have it. Uh, so, and that is beginning to make life uh, more normal. Um, in terms, going back to your, your, your question of best of times, worst of times, um, the Jewish answer, of course, is both. Uh, you know, we 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 do very we we do may avdut lecherut from slavery to freedom, miagon uh, lesimcha from suffering to to joy. We have achash uh, ferosh, but then we have Mordechai. You know, it's always a continuum, a spectrum, and we're always prepared for the worst. You know, you know the definition of a Jewish telegram: uh, start worrying, details follow. <laughs> um, but but what I worry about is, uh, 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 Sir Simon talked about it is tribalism. I would say the sectarianism um, and sectarianism. I don't, I'm not speaking in a religious context, but the sort of zero sum game. If I'm right, you must be wrong and you must be wrong in a fashion that gives me the right uh, to go after you with every means possible. We saw that on January 6th and in the insurrection on Capitol Hill here. Uh, and we've seen it in many other ways. We see it mostly coming from uh, the right uh, currently, but I think the left is not immune to traces of that. Uh, but it means that uh, talk, it certainly in, it, to use an American setting, talking across the aisle politically, um, maybe they do the same thing in Canberra, um, uh, is seen as uh, being disloyal to your own side. Uh, and, you know, Micah's Come Let Us, what is it? I think it's the, the book of Micah, Come Let Us Reason Together, is seen as betrayal. That is not good. And to end with going back to the Jews, uh, that's never good for the Jews. Uh, so never, what, can, ever good can for we, the Jews. Can we help situate that in time, Deborah? I mean, when did that begin in your memory? And sort of there, you know, certainly in U.S. political history, there have been times of fractious division, including and especially in the Civil War. Um, but we know that, that there were even violent uh, exchanges on the House of, uh, on the, in the halls of the House and Senate uh, in the 19th century. <clears throat> but we seem to have uh, reached a point where uh, the two sides can only engage in this zero-sum thinking. Um, and one of the teams in particular seems not to be playing by the rules of the game, which in the game of democracy is, is a lethal condition. So how would you situate that and, and how would you apply that, uh, that, that uh, scenario to the Jewish case? Are we in a similar state of fractiousness? And if so, to what do you attribute that? When did it begin? Um, and right. what's our way out? Um, in the United States, I would say it began in earnest uh, with the election of Barack Obama. I think there were a lot of people in the United States who could not fathom a black man uh, as president, a black family living in the White House. We began to see radicalization. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security spoke about that early on in the Obama administration. And the Republicans pushed back and said, this is awful. How can you say that? And it's just political. And they pulled back. Of course, they were absolutely correct. I think uh, uh, Janet Napolitano was then um, uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, and she was the one who was pushing it, and they had to pull back. Um, I think it started with that. It started to a certain extent with the Tea Party, which was the bailout after the 2008 uh, economic crisis. Um, but it was people playing on that, using it. Uh, Don, uh, my point is that Donald Trump didn't invent the sectarianism we see in the United States. And I know I'm speaking to an Australian audience. And actually, I remember I was there, I think it was summer 2019. I was, it was at the Antidote Festival at the Opera House and then the uh, Melbourne Writers Festival. And I always love my visits to Australia, which have been, been a, n a number. And I'm hoping soon to come back. I know now New Zealand can come to you and you can go to New Zealand. So let's hope that'll extend to us soon. Um, but these things spread. You know, when I talked about ex uh, sectarianism earlier, David, um, I, I, gave, I used it in an American context, but we saw how it spread. We saw the politicization of masks, of wearing of masks. That began in great measure in our country because of the then president, uh, something which should have been a no-brainer. Just wear a mask. What's, what, what political point are you making by not wearing one? 
Uh, but it spread quickly to other countries. It spread to Germany, it spread to France, it spread to UK to a certain extent. So with social media, which I love, we wouldn't be having this conversation, but for social media, when it works, it's terrific, um, but allows these things to spread. Uh, so I would say I would uh, currently taking a smaller view, not a longer view, I would date it to um, the election of Obama, the economic downturn. That's often always there's that underlying case and uh, the rise of uh, the right, the white supremacist, white power, white nationalist right. right. Which was, of course, latent, but then pushed to the surface and elevated by uh, by that economic upheaval. So, uh, Sir Simon, I wonder if you can give us um, a more global framing for that fractiousness and sectarianism that Deborah spoke of. Um, the uh, Hungarian prime minister has referred to um, his worldview as illiberal democracy, um, which is essentially a form of majoritarianism that says, if I have 50 votes plus one, I can change the rules of the game. And that is an idea that seemed to have really taken hold from uh, from Israel to uh, to the United States. Um, how do you periodize, contextualize, date this uh, I have a new mm. No, I'm sorry, David. Um, I'll, I'll, and and uh, thank you so much for being so kind, but I think we can drop, um, you know, the sir <laughs> bit, really. It's very kind of you to do this, you know. Why is this we don't night know what protocol is, so thank you for yeah, the right guide. Why is this night different? Because he doesn't really care about being called sir. But thank you very much for the... Um, I just typically, in an annoying scholarly style, I just want to extend rather than amend uh, before I come on to Victor Orban and, and uh, uh, you know, identity nationalism. Um, and I think actually one, one, of the, one of the turning points, if we think about the possibility of defending... Uh, or rather attacking the use of masks, which, as Deborah says quite rightly, ought to be a no-brainer. You know, some of that actually goes all the way back to Ronald Reagan's revival of libertarianism or, or encouragement of libertarianism, or that famous sentence, the most frightening, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase, I'm not going to get quite right, the most frightening words in the English language are, I'm, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And um, yeah. <laughs> I think actually that sowed the seeds um, of uh, e enormous kind of almost paranoid suspicion of government guidance in and um, you know it's it become absolutely lethal in the case of actually the government sponsorship of reliable scientific and public health knowledge but in all sorts of other respects too this is why the good news again to our friends in Australia or at least the provisionally good news is that without making a great kind of you know, trumpet voluntary, a great trumpet flourish out of it. Um, Joe Biden seems to be reviving without any sense of defensiveness and how um, the necessary role of government um, in in respect to these enormous uh, pieces of legislation on, on infrastructure and on uh, dealing with the pandemic and so on. Um, I would also say actually that um, we're going through a list of presidents now, and I do agree completely with um, Deborah. I, w I do want to stress that, that um, the, the sort of sense on the American right, um, and I think out there in in the sort of um, uglier regions of American prejudice, that Barack Obama, that the Barack Obama as a president was a kind of unnatural thing in American history, contributed horribly to um, violently racist, extreme racist opinions and anti-Semitic opinions being brought more into uh, the possible normal area of discourse. But I, I would also want to um, just invoke the period after 9-11 when there was such a sense of insecurity and such a sense of shock um, that the temptation really to provide a kind of political ideology, which at the same time was militarily aggressive, but also reached somehow deep into the issue of what is truly American or what is not truly American, also stirred that particular pot. Now, without, without um, you know, uh, more of, um, uh, without going on too long, uh, your question, David, is very germane about, about the... Um, the robustness, really, of what should we call it, nationalist chauvinism or something like that. 
Um, a part of Viktor Orban's particular uh, stance, we know, whether disingenuously or, or adopted, as in the case of the Law and Justice Party in, in Poland, whether, whether disingenuously or sincerely adopted, is the so-called defense of, um, of Europe, of Christian Europe in particular, against kind of insidious outsiders in the form of migrants. And the great kind of crisis which Europe fa faced and you know, Angela Merkel's extremely generous, expansive view of the number of immigrants she would be prepared to settle in Germany just absolutely, you know, brought that into boiling point. And notwithstanding the kind of hard empirical data that there's not been an enormous flood of, of monstrously atrocious crime attributed to immigrant populations, non-Christian immigrant populations, nonetheless, this, this did have an extraordinary effect on on making nationalism sort of tribal atavistic nationalism not something of the past as generation after generation particularly after the second world war had hoped but something that had um much longer legs than i suspect many academics like me suspected i i've always felt i think you both know this but um, I'm sort of brooding on this subject at the moment as a kind of writing project. I always suspect that um, gen baby boom generation of which I belong, I was born before the Second World War ended, actually, just about. We were sort of badly prepared or we prepared ourselves very badly to see nationalism as anything except a kind of contemptible anachronism, which had wrought horrific damage on the world and on the Jews in particular. And therefore we were kind of, you know, we, we, we took really the psychological staying power of nationalism too lightly and the centrality of the Cold War between two opposing ideologies of liberal capitalism and Marxist totalitarianism also made us think really that nationalism was a sort of um, a kind of quaint subject, almost a subject fit for anthropology and ethnography, but not for serious contemplation of what the future was. A, a book which you'll both know, justly celebrated by Benedict Anderson called Imagine Communities, I think in a weird way contributed to this, I, <coughs> I would say, sort of modernist complacency about nationalism in the, the very title, Imagine Communities, gave the sense in which this was a kind of fatuously trivial invention of the romantic movement or whatever whatever else and it had no actual social power or psychological force compared to things like class or the international capitalist market or or such like and i think we really swallowed that particular line as it turns out at our peril well i would say that in addition to underestimating the staying power of nationalism it's also the case that the forces of globalization that were unleashed in the early 21st century exacerbated uh, a sense of, uh, of, of displacement um, that reinforced the most, most ethnocentric elements of nationalism. So um, the dynamic between those two forces seems to me a really critical uh, point in understanding where we are today. And that, I think, brings us squarely to a conversation about Jews, because uh, Ethnocentric nationalism, on one hand, um, has not, in many ways, been good for Jews, even as some Jews have embraced it. Uh, meanwhile, globalization um, is both an economic and, and social force, but also a kind of perception uh, that is cloaked in this accusation of Jewish power. So um, I want to turn now to Deborah and ask her, where are we at in that sort of balance between globalization and ethnocentric nationalism, and particularly with respect to the Jews. Where do they stand in this very dynamic, uh, uh, very uh, tremulous um, period? Um, and particularly, where does anti-Semitism stand? Something you've thought a little bit uh, about in, over the, your career. A little bit, and what do we have, three hours? And I'll, I'll, I'll make a start. Um, you know, about a year ago, a little more than a year ago, I started wearing a Jewish star. Why did I start? I'd never wore one before in my life. I've gotten them as presents. They ended up in the back of the drawer when I moved, you know, sort of they were rusted and ready to be given away or thrown away or whatever. Uh, because I began to think about what was going on in the United States, certainly in terms of 
white privilege, uh, George Floyd and, and, and other things like, and too many other things precisely like that, Breonna Taylor, et cetera, the names are innumerable. Um, and I didn't want to have white privilege as, as much as I, I knew I have it, but I wanted to say, this is who I am. I wanted to broadcast my identity. And um, it's just been an interesting experience wearing it. Having said that, I would say for Jews, this has been a gun using, uh, you know, best of times, tale of two cities, worst of times, the best of times, um, certainly uh, in many respects, Jewish involvement in the in the, and and acceptance and you know uh, being the least rejected of all the minority groups around. On the other hand, uh, the rise of anti-Semitism in very subtle and sometimes not so subtle ways, um, and the rise of anti-Semitism and this may not be popular with all people um, on both the right and the left. You know, as as David, as, as you may know, and, and you as well, Simon, I wrote a book on the Eichmann trial uh, for the next book series a couple of years ago. And in my chapter on Hannah Arendt and, and of course, her, her writings about the trial, I found two different reactions when the book came out. Uh, once, I think I was at the Center for Jewish History, which David knows well, and gave a very great audience. And um, I think I was in conversation with Jan Gross about the book. And someone stood up and said, I read your book and you're way too kind to Hannah Arendt. You're way too kind. Because I looked at ways in which she made some justifiable comments. Uh, fast forward a couple of weeks, I was at Bard at the Arendt Center at Bard and someone stood up and said, I knew Hannah Arendt. Hannah Arendt was a friend of mine and you don't deserve to be here. You're, what you say about her is horrible. And as I walked out, I said to my host, I, I said, I must have gotten Arendt precisely right if I'm annoying both sides that way. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I think it's the same thing with anti-Semitism. I recently, I just had an article last week in the forwards marking the fact that it was, uh, April 11th was the, uh, 60th anniversary of the beginning of the Eichmann trial and the 20th anniversary of the judgment in my trial in England. And I don't compare the two, but I, I looked at what each one had to teach us and how anti-Semitism was at their core. It's an obvious comment, but something that I, I wanted to pull out. Um, well, I got notes from people saying, and, and that I, I was against anti-Semitism irrespective of where it came from. Uh, it's on the right and on the left. In this country right now, it's much more dangerous from the right, but it's not absent on the left as we saw certainly not so long ago with the Labor Party under Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and it wasn't just in relation to Israel. Um, and I, of course, got notes from people saying you're so wrong about the, the right and people saying you're so wrong of the left. And um, of course, the my friends, whoops, excuse me, my friends who were on the right uh, said, you know, you don't, you, you have to talk more about the left. They, they see it very clearly on the left and they are right when they, do, they're correct when they do so. And my friends on the opposite side, in other words, people on each side see it perfectly on the other side of the political transom, but fail to see it right next to them. And I find All that right. very disturbing. You know, it's the so weaponization of anti-Semitism. Let's drill down a little bit more on, on this point. Um, there has been um, a chronicled uptick, a very significant uptick in the number of reported anti-Semitic incidents in the United States over the last five years, which roughly coincides mm -hmm. with what you call the Trump regime. Um, certainly the most uh, murderous um, uh, and dangerous forms of expression, uh, without any doubt, come from the white nationalist right um, and its fellow travelers. Um, and that you would certainly agree with. Um, can you talk about, you know, the sort of uh, collateral um, anti-Semitism like that grades into sort of mainstream right wing media on one hand and then elaborate on what where you see really um, anti-Semitism on the left? It's something you you feel it's important to talk about. So tell us what that looks like specifically, if right. you could. OK, look, the anti-Semitism on the right, Pittsburgh, Poway. Charlottesville, the Unite the Right rally, which was just replete with anti-Semitism. Uh, that had all those things. What, what was the, the murderer 
and Pittsburgh yelling as the SWAT team was bringing him down, yelling at the dead Jews, the Jews he had just murdered who had come to Shul. Um, uh, you will not destroy the white race or the uh, murderer in Poway in San Diego or in Halle, Germany. Um, they all see, and, and in, in, in Charlottesville, in the rally, Unite the Right, what were they chanting on that Friday night as they marched across the campus of the University of Virginia with their tiki torches? Uh, Jews will not replace us. So I'm, I, I know I'm still focusing on the right, but uh, their view is that um, uh, goes to white genocide replacement theory, white Christian replacement theory. It, it goes under many names, uh, has its roots to a certain degree in a book from the 70s, The Turner Diaries by Pierce, um, in which, uh, and, and, and it has mutated in different forms, but essentially argues that black people, brown people, people of color, uh, you know, there is a plan to bring them in to Europe, bring them into this country, swarms, hordes, all these negative terms used um, in order to destroy uh, white Christian Anglo-Saxon culture. Look, I'm talking to you from Georgia, the state of Georgia, not far from where I live. There's a, a district, a congressional district represented by a Marjorie Taylor Greene. She's the one who believes that Jews have, the Rothschilds had space lasers and that's what called the, caused the wildfires in California. Um, but her office is, is put out a statement of creating a America First uh, Caucus on Capitol Hill, all about Anglo-Saxon um, purity, Anglo-Saxon, I forget the, I don't think it was purity, they weren't asked that bad. Of course, she later walked it back and said, oh, it was just a draft, but it meant, even if it's just a draft, someone is thinking in those directions. Right. Um, so that is that is terribly, terribly disturbing. What they arguing is, of course, that these people of color, these black people, brown people, whatever, they're not capable of having these gains on their own. Barack Obama couldn't have made it into the White House on his own. There's someone behind them, the puppeteer, and that puppeteer is the Jew. On the and it, and of course it manifests us in a very violent fashion. On the left, it is not as violent. I'm not saying the two are equal, but I'm saying that they're, they're, they're there as well. Um, and we see it sometimes. We see it in opposition or, or in the way criticism of Israel is voiced, or using criticism of Israel as a shield for an anti-Semitic attitude. And I want to make it quite clear. I think uh, maybe bringing Cole to Newcastle, even though it's an Australian audience, um, that. Of course, I'm not talking about criticism of Israeli policy. You want your criticism of Israeli policy, go to the Knesset, go to the Knesset. I'm knocking everything over here, getting a little, I guess, sahits about what passion. I'm talking about. <laughs> um, passion, passion. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, uh, of course, I'm not talking about criticism, but when you talk about uh, uh, Nazi-like tactics, when you talk about Israel manipulating the world, when you, when you do certain things, and we know what they are, when it crosses the line from legitimate criticism to uh, using anti-Semitic tropes or engaging in anti-Semitism, we see it there as well. I'm not equating the two, but I'm saying they're both worrisome and i'm against it irrespective of where it comes from right so uh let's turn to simon and um i think we all would share um that sense of discomfort with anti-semitism whatever quarter it issues from um i'm particularly discomfited by not just um what i think is by far the most lethal and dangerous forms of anti-semitism that coming from the right but also a, a discomfitting um, tolerance for um, uh, a kind of um, white nationalist um, uh, pro-Christian rhetoric that issues from some right-wing Jewish quarters, um, including, I should say, in Israel itself. And I wonder, Simon, if you can help us understand where that comes from. Um, well, again, again, if you, I, I, I don't mean to be a pest, David, and your, your question is very good, and I promise to come on to it in a minute. Um, I yeah. do just want to say, actually, apropos of what, what Deborah was uh, talking about a minute ago, that, um, well, for a start, I'll begin by saying that it took exactly two hours, really, um, from the announcement of the creation of a super league, a soccer super league in Europe, for there to be the first... Uh, accusation online that this was a Jewish plot. Really, this is funny and not so funny because it was accompanied by a kind of striker, Julia Stryker standard um, cartoon of 
the Jews being responsible for this nefarious conspiracy to bring down traditional football. Um, you, you, a lot of, lot of your viewers may well know that um, Albert Bula, who of course is a Salonika Jew, Salonika Sephardi Jew, um, and who actually got his scientific degrees at the Aristotle University, which was built, constructed upon the ruined remains of the Salonika cemetery going back many hundred years, uh, at least one newspaper, not a central newspaper, a newspaper nonetheless that has 10% of the market, um, demonized Albert Buhler, the CEO of Pfizer, sorry, I should have said that, um, as being the instrument of, uh, rather in the, in the style that George Soros has regularly wheeled out, as being an instrument of an infernal international Jewish conspiracy to inject the arms of Christian Greeks with poison. So there is a kind of weird way in which actually the age of the internet has become a kind of golden age of um, conspiracy theory and demonology. And I suppose Tim Berners-Lee and others and Steve Jobs and so on who imagined the internet really as a kind of transparent channel by which you know truth would be established uh, with um, unquestionable epistemological sources um, have seen the most kind of monstrous uh, sort of witch's brew of conspiracy theories and unsupported paranoid uh, ideologies of which replacement theory uh, mentioned by Deborah is, you know, a, a, an appalling example. And in fact, has been recently normalized by the most successful um, television host on Fox News in the evening, Tucker Carlson, as something to be taken seriously. So we're in we're in a kind of epistemological knowledge crisis um, at the moment. But now to go on to your to your proper question about actually um how you know how i mean i some of us i think you know we're talking to a new an nif new israel fund audience here but so i'm sure a number of you will have been shocked to see um <coughs> the uh, bazalel smotrich and others representing the perpetuation of kahanism um having seats enter the knesset and um you know one one could on the one hand say well you know, the possibility of nationalist ideologies of purity um, since Zeb Jabotinsky was always there, a kind of flirtation um, with the idea of the purity of the Jewish race and the Jewish race as a kind of Jewish race and religion as something that had to be kept purely apart. But, you know, Jabotinsky, read the Iron Wall, for example, there's no doubt that he flirted with a kind of you know, tribal, almost quasi-fascism at certain points. Jabotinsky was also a very, very hard-boiled empiricist in some piece of his brain and mind, um, as indeed were his successors like Menachem Begin and even Ariel Sharon, if they weren't exactly multilateral pluralists and expansive in their view of the nature of Israel, uh, they nonetheless were, in some sense, uh, Democrats. They they saw that if you really wanted to keep Israel as a Jewish democratic state and be faithful, therefore, to, to the declaration, the original declaration of Israeli independence in, in 1948, then there was no alternative but to have a two-state solution. Um, otherwise, you know, whether you liked it or not, you would be, in that awful phrase, swamped, really, by uh, by Arab demography. That itself, actually, of course, actually, is of lesser concern to the extreme right-wing and religious messianic purists in Israel now, because, as we know, the demographic performance, if we can call it that, of the Haredi community is, is if anything, even more demonstrably expansive, let me put it that way, um, than that of... Um, the non-Jewish population in Israel. So there has always, I, I would say, you know, in the history of Zionism, um, there's always been a kind of struggle between um, the, the basic principle that the essential ideal of what Israel is, is a Jewish democratic um, state, and those really for whom this wasn't so much of a, uh, wasn't so much of a, a priority, that you could actually uncouple what is thought of are the norms of liberal democracy, as long as the Jewish bit of the Jewish state was always paramount. So while we think of really the Kahanist extremes, Torah Judaism mm -hmm. and so on, and 
the wilder shores of messianic propaganda in the settlements as being somehow you know, beyond the fringe. There again, just as I was saying earlier, we we're a little complacent about the way in which tribal nationalism has the means constantly to modernize itself so that les extremes se touche, so appeals to kind of archaic or biblical prescriptions about what it means to be Jewish meet the internet and they produce something really fiery and dynamic and, um, and uh, you know, with... Uh, as much future as uh, as there has been a past. I would add, though, on a slightly cheerier note, the slightly the the <laughs> other side of Charles Dickens' opening, um, that there are unexpected things that happen, of course, namely uh, the ability of the Arab parties in the last election to determine the fate of a Netanyahu or any kind of government. And you know, sometimes things just sort of fall out in the in in w which actually make a kind of hermetic seal between a pure and an impure Israel, uh, not only impossible, but also ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. So it seems to me that it will be a very good day when uh, an Israeli government is uh, formed with the participation of an Arab party. It will be a good day for Ar Israeli democracy when that happens. Um, but uh, Deborah, uh, we have about five minutes left, and um, I want to now turn our attention to Israel. Um, and what Simon offered was at once soothing and uncomfortable. Um, on one hand, we have seen scourges of uh, hyper-nationalism, ethnocentric nationalism um, before and weathered it, and in fact, embedded in them as in revisionist Zionism were also some very powerful democratizing impulses. And yet at the same time, uh, the capacity of new media to transform and render more dangerous those impulses is a source of concern. So in turning our attention to Israel, what are your um, concerns and and sources of optimism. And I would say now to bring it home to our NIF audience in Australia, what do you see as NIF's role? How can we be um, of help? Uh, yeah, let me, before I turn to Israel, I just want to point out one thing, which I think was a, a, a terrific moment in American political history or contemporary events. Uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken, whose uh, stepfather was a survivor of the Holocaust, um, on Yom HaShoah, gave the speech of the, Yom, the official uh, Yom HaShoah or Holocaust uh, Memorial Day uh, speech. Uh, and um, he talked about the failure of America during World War II in regards to rescue of the Jews, the complicity. And that was an amazing moment to have a sec, because it, it was the State Department that was most responsible for it. So that's something to hold on to, I think, in a, in a very invigorating way. What I see in Israel and what keeps me up at night is this exact same thing. I mean, we go back, maybe go back to where exactly where we started with uh, Simon talking about tribalism and me talking about sectarianism. A split. You go. You go from you know the the ubiquitous cafe in Tel Aviv, the beachfront cafe in Tel Aviv, to certain areas of Jerusalem or settlements, and you you are in two different countries, and two different countries, which see each other as zero. See the other side as a zero sum game. Um, and we saw it, of course, with the uh, pandemic, with the uh, COVID and attitudes towards different groups, et cetera, um, and behavior of certain groups. But I see a split there. And I see a split that's only being reinforced, certainly by uh, uh, Netanyahu um, in, in his leadership. And, and he, of course, was in good company with President Trump all, uh, for the past four years. So it's that division, that inability to say, you know, as I, I quoted um, Micah earlier, come let us reason together. Um, the idea that if I sit down with the people with whom I disagree, there's something wrong with me. Um, mm -hmm. There's a new book I was just reading about it this morning that in fact uses uh, BJ, the uh, iconic synagogue in Mene Cheshren in New York, um, in terms of talking about differences, um, it's just come out, I think this week, it's coming out this week, and how uh, talking across the divide, um, it's, it's the hardest thing to do, to listen to people with whom you totally disagree, not only totally disagree, but think are 
absolutely wrong, if not dangerous. I was speaking to a woman, a very well-educated woman not long ago, uh, multilingual, talented, et cetera. And she was telling me how COVID is all a hoax and more people have died from broken hearts or whatever it is. And, you know, it, it took all I, my restraint to tell her she's a blooming idiot, but nobody ever changed their mind because you told them they're, they're idiots. Uh, it's going to be very hard to get across this divide. It's going to be very hard to find conversation partners on the other side, whatever side that may be. But we really have to try to listen to each other. And I'm not saying that it's an, uh, it, it's hard. It's hard. It, it makes uh, sometimes listening to what people on the other side of where I stand politically, whether it's in Israel or whether it's in the United States or any other place in the world, is trying in the extreme. But I think if the New Israel Fund can help somehow, and this may go beyond the mandate, but David, I put it in your hands, um, to find those ways of cross communication, um, that will be a real service. They came up to the scene many years ago, I remember when it was created, to deal with neglected issues in Israel, Israel's that, uh, issues that were not being well supported. And, and here is a neglected issue, not just in Israel, but in the Jewish community worldwide. And if you can somehow find the ways to, to, to bring us together, at least to talk to one another, um, I think that would be of critical importance. Right. And maybe a final brief word from Simon on this very question. Yes, you please, please. talked about the Kulturkampf, the cultural war between Jews. What's your sense of what we can well, and should be is, doing? It's very profound. We, we have a two-state problem inside Israel. <laughs> Just, you know, the New Israel Fund is an absolutely wonderful institution. Um, but uh, along with organizations like Yachad, we've been thinking quite rightly, um, primarily about the occupation, about the relationship between Israeli Jewish culture and the Palestinians, um, about race problems inside Israel with Beta Israel and, and so on. And I, I absolutely, this again puts it so unreasonably in your lap, David, but I can't think of anyone or any institution better than LF to deal with this. There is another divide, which in, indeed, as I'm just echoing Deborah now, um, a gulf across which the New Israel Fund might want to try and, for example, you know, uh, talk seriously and substantively with um, representatives of the Haredi community. And they're not all a monolithic block. We know this very, very well. Um, and talk to settlers even um, the, 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 as well in order to engage in some sort of uh, constructive dialogue. Because after all, you know, um, Tel Aviv, Israel is not going to shut down Geula and Me'a Sharim, and um, Torah Judaism is gonna, isn't going to close down Tel Aviv. We all have to somehow live with each other, and it's much best done without, as Deborah says, assuming essentially um, the, the side with which you do not agree are necessarily enemies. Well, well said, and I must say that one of the most important initiatives for me um, over the last few years at NIF has been our uh, forging an alliance with a group called the Haredim Chadashim, the new Haredim, um, who have been superb partners in trying to envisage a different kind of Israel where you can indeed um, reach across the chasm. Um, and that is really a source of hope in what otherwise can seem a despairing situation. Um, uh, nonetheless, um, we also derive hope from having uh, such extraordinary um, intellectuals uh, as, as the two people here, Professor Deborah Lipstadt and Sir Simon Shama. Thank you so much for making time out of your busy schedules to be with us. Um, and thank you to our wonderful audience uh, in Australia. We love you. We love NAF Australia. Um, and together, um, we shall overcome. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David.